Hi, my name is Mitch Bone. I'm the president of the MSUB College Democrats and a member of the Yellowstone County Central Committee. And today I am a state auditor candidate, Shane Morjo. How are you doing tonight, Shane? I'm doing good. Thanks, Mitch. Good. So my first question to you is just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for state auditor. Yeah, yeah. So um, a little bit about me. I, I'm born and raised in, in Ronan, Montana. Um, I uh, grew up in, in rural Montana. I went to forestry school here at the University of Montana. Um, I also went to, to law school here at the University of Montana and uh, did, a, did a year uh, Master's of Law program at the University of Arizona and then I came back and um, started working here. Uh, in between that time I earned my pilot's license um, uh, and I just really enjoyed flying. I haven't had time to do a lot of that over the last few years but um, it's something I, I did had a really good pa big passion for and then um, I'm also currently a state legislator of, of two terms and um, you know I'm running because I actually believe that Montanans uh, still want candidates that are actually from our communities that grew up there, lived through the very issues and um, had the same very discussions about the things in our, our communities. Um, I think we still want people uh, in these seats who understand those and understand the issues that we're looking to change. And um, you know, this, this particular, op particular office, I think it's one of the most important offices in Montana. Um, I think it's one of the most important offices that people don't know enough about or don't talk enough about in Montana. Um, especially because uh, it can have a direct impact on your ability to access healthcare um, and, and have affordable and meaningful coverage. Um, so that's something I take very serious and that's something I really want to work hard on, on, on improving in the state of Montana. That's great. So you mentioned a little bit what the state auditor does and how they can protect things like healthcare, um, but what more does the state auditor's office do that we don't know about? Yeah. Uh, so the state auditor's office is, it's really a criminal justice agency. It's, um, it's mandated in statute to ensure fairness and transparency for consumers. And um, it's intended to ensure that um, they have access for, uh, with fair, fairness and access to securities and insurance um, for consumers. And so the office is really tasked with regulating insurance, regulating securities, um, investments, um, it litigates, it prosecutes, it, it investigates issues. It, so it enforces both the Securities Act um, and the insurance code. Um, and one of the big pieces that I think um, it should do more of um, is, is investigate fraud cases. Um, a big part of the office is with the insurance side is insurance rate review. Um, and I often say, you know, your question is what does it do? I, I often like to say, what, what, does it, what does it do? What should it be doing? Um, I think those are two very different things. I think it should be doing more to provide transparency and, and education um, and, it, and doing more to try and expand access uh, to protect over our, our 5.2 million acres of public lands. The state auditor sits on the, the state land board um, and we shouldn't be fighting programs like Habitat Montana, which the current state land board um, has done a lot through the last, done a lot of through the last couple of years. Um, and you know, people really need help. You know, I, I talked to a woman um, a couple days ago and she was sharing a story with me about how she's been trying to get her, her 85 year old husband um, a walker. And she's called and called and um, they've sent certified letters and they've tried to do follow up and they can't get anyone to get back to them to explain to them why it's not getting covered. And these guys are living on a fixed income. Um, and she just feels like nobody cares and nobody's helping her. And so I think this office, um, I just want people to know that this office is here for them, that it, that it shouldn't be the last option. I want it to be something that's proactive, out there helping folks answer some questions like that, um, helping them work through those issues when people are kind of jerking them around. That's great. That's definitely something we need. I've had an instance, I'm in a wheelchair myself and I had an insurance company run around a whole year after a car accident I was in trying to get me a new chair and I had to go on an old chair that didn't really work and they wouldn't accept it for over a year. So definitely we need an office that works with us. Yeah. I mean, this, this particular person, you know, similar in, in many ways, uh, the person is needs a walker is, is very tall. Um, 
and they need a, a special like height, you know, walker. They can't just buy anyone because the the, the man is so tall. Mm -hmm. um, and so they need a specific one to help him or else it, it'll set him up for more injuries if he doesn't have the right one. That's not right that we do that to people. Um, so you've mentioned a little bit about your background, but what makes you qualified to be the state auditor? With yeah, I, so, you know, I think, I, I really do think I'm the best candidate for this job out of, you know, out of all the, the five candidates, um, both Democrats and Republicans. I, I have almost a, a decade of legal experience um, in transactions, in civil litigation, insurance, criminal law. I was a prosecutor for uh, just about two years. Um, I've done healthcare, healthcare policy, employment law. Um, I've won cases. I've won at the Supreme Court. I've won a federal court case just recently. Um, I've won in tribal courts. I practiced in administrative courts. Um, I practiced in all of those. Um, and I've been successful at the legislature. Uh, doing, during the two terms um, as a legislator, I passed nine bills. And I'm proud of that because a lot of my bills have been focused on actually trying to help people in Montana, get them on um, equal footing um, with our peers. You know, one of the bills I passed was the Montana Promise Act. That was the uh, bill I passed in my first session, which was um, intended to um, get access to, to, to college for low income um, individuals to be able to access grants to go to college. And then last session, I passed uh, one of uh, a big bill, um, House Bill 640, which was a bill to protect victims um, from childhood sex abuse. And that was a very large package of uh, both address criminal and civil side of legislation. Um, so, you know, I, I bring those up because I, I think it shows that I, you know, I have a skill set that's diverse uh, and I'm actually, I've proven that my heart's in this for the right reasons um, and that I'm here uh, to help people in Montana and that I can actually get stuff done. Um, you know, I grew up in a, in a Indian community. Um, I'm a member of the Salish and Kootenai tribes and I grew up um, on an Indian reservation, uh, the Flathead Indian Res Reservation. And our Indian communities continue to be at the bottom of every social indicator um, in this country. Um, I think that's unacceptable. I grew up in, in Ronan, myself in a low income family. Um, and I think it's been instilled in me a desire uh, and passion to fight for others, uh, to ensure that um, people have the same opportunities and access as everyone else. Um, and we need to do more um, on that front to make sure that people are, are being able to access things like um, healthcare, which I've said, several times one of my my big points is that um you know we talk about education being the great equalizer um i think access to health care is right there in that equation um we need to do more in the state to make sure that people have access to health care because it really does have a major impact on um, your quality of life and the things that you can um, do in this state and i think i'll bring that to to everybody in the state of montana our indian communities all of our communities our rural communities and our urban communities. Um, and we, we just need to do a lot more on teaching people about the markets, um, providing them more transparency on the costs and giving them the information that they, they deserve to know. You know, this, this ultimately, um, when we give people information on, on what these companies are charging them, the transparent costs and, and, and healthcare products and the pricing, um, people are more informed. It puts more pressure on the markets, the people selling the products. Um, to be more fair because then people are going to shop around and pick the, the products that, that are treating them right. And so I think that's one big way um, we can accomplish that um, in getting people on the right track. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, um, one of the big things is, is that's as far as like our healthcare community um, or our health healthcare in our communities is um, when we, when we provide transparency, it also, uh, make sure that the, the ultimate models of pricing are, are fair and transparent. Um, so uh, I'll let you go to the next question because I'm probably repeating myself now. You're totally fine. Um, so I just want to know what are your thoughts on the insurance industry and how you can help the people of Montana? Yeah, so, you know, my thoughts on, on the industry is, you know, I think industry, this, I, I said it earlier, you know, this is one of the most important offices that people don't talk enough about or know enough about. Um, insurance is necessary. Uh, it's, it's one of those things where none of us really want to pay uh, in, for insurance because it's oftentimes we think of it as like we're paying for it and I might not get in an accident or I might not have an issue for 10 years or 20 years. Um, but when you need it, 
and it's there, you're, you're very happy that you do have it. Um, so, you know, I really don't want uh, people to go without it. And, and I think it's important to, and, you know, kind of tying into the last point that I, I was uh, trying to get to is, um, you know, there's a lot of people who, who in the state who would qualify, for instance, under the exchange for uh, low, low cost policies or zero, almost zero cost policies. And a lot of that ties into to education and making sure that people understand um, that system and that process. A lot of times people are just overwhelmed with it. They don't know where to even start. Um, this, this office should be doing more to help people on that front. Um, so, you know, I just, I want people to be insured. I think there's a lot of opportunities to get people um, insured. And I just don't want people to put themselves and their, and their family at risk. I, I think um, we have a lot of uh, potential with this office to do outreach, community outreach. Um, you know, I've talked about how this office can do more to uh, provide educational trainings, um, provide uh, information on your rights as an insured, um, and keep you up to date on fraud trainings. And, and I'm committed to traveling the state to do that. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is like specifically when we talk about um, protecting people through this office in the second part of your question, mm -hmm. um, protecting Montanans um, from, from insurance uh, and securities fraud, uh, as, I, as I alluded to earlier, um, you know, I really want to improve the protections uh, that the office provides. I'll actively pursue legal actions against bad actors. I'll ramp up the investigative arm of the office. Um, I think that's been weakened, in my, in my opinion. Um, I'll ask the legislature to fund the vacant positions that were let slide, um, let slide by the, the current uh, incumbent, um, over $650,000 in seven positions. Um, this office needs that, those types of funds to do, do the critical work that has uh, statutorily been set out to do. Um, people expect this office to fill its promise um, and primary mission to protect, protect them um, and protect consumers through insurance and securities regulation. Um, we need to bring transparency and accountability back. I think that's another way we uh, protect people in the insurance industry. I, I mentioned this earlier, um, increasing transparency to health care costs. It's one of the Number one things I continue to hear um, when I travel the state and make phone calls to people, people are still confused as to what they're paying for or how those numbers are derived. People deserve to know. People deserve to know um, how those costs are derived and what, um, what they're actually paying for. And again, I think when we have clarity in, in our um, pricing and in our laws and all of that, I think it puts pressure on the markets um, and, it, and it creates a better um, uh, better markets for consumers and when we do that. Um, I think, uh, you know, another thing that we can do is, uh, is continue to do our efforts with uh, telemedicine. I think that's made a big difference, especially during COVID. Um, I know a lot of people who have um, individually uh, use, utilized telemedicine and it's been very um, helpful to the families. It's, it's, you know, I mean, I'd honestly say it's probably even saved lives, you know, keeping people from going and interacting with others and getting them sick. Um, you know, so I think that's a big part of, um, those are types of solutions that we should continue to strive to do more of. Um, of course, making sure rates are, the data and the rates are, that are being proposed by insurance companies are fair and affordable. And you know, last but not least, uh, we need to crack down on, on junk insurance plans and, and health sharing scams. Um, you know, I'll get to the, a little bit more to the health sharing scams and, and um, my discussion in a little bit, but I, I just think that I, I don't I don't think people um, often understand that they're get, given a false sense of security and hope with some of those programs. And um, I'll do everything in my power to make sure uh, we're protecting people in Montana, especially those with pre-existing conditions, which is why I'm uh, especially not fond of junk insurance programs. Definitely. So my next question is um, in Billings in Eastern Montana, especially we get hail yearly or sometimes more than more than once a year. Um, how can you address the rising premiums on insurance plans after a storm or after hail storms? Yeah, I mean, this is this is something I hear a lot of about when I especially when I'm in the Billings area. And and, you know, I, I have seen this issue come up in the legislature. Um, last session, uh, we had a good start uh, on this and we actually were able to um, 
to make some progress on this front. We passed a bill, um, Senator Mary McNally, um, actually this was in 2017, um, she passed Senate Bill 58, and that was a, a bill for zero cost claims being used against you. Um, so if you didn't have a, if you had a zero cost claim, the insurance company couldn't look back and use that against you when um, deciding whether to renew you or drop you. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that go through my mind when I think about what we can be doing uh, for, for folks, in, especially in those areas where they're hit hardest by um, natural disasters such as hail. Um, you know, one thing I've thought of um, proposing, um, and this is a really important part of the auditor's office too, is, is actually um, proposing policy and legislation for the upcoming legislature to um, make fixes uh, so that we are doing more to, to protect Montanans. Um, one of the thoughts I had is, you know, we, we could look into is capping the, the deductible, uh, the percentage um, that a, a provider, um, that an insurance company is, is charging you for a premium. Um, oftentimes what we've seen in the um, eastern part of the state is uh, one, per, one to two um, percent is based, the deductible is valued on um, what the value of the home is. And so, you know, someone who owns uh, a $300,000 or $500,000 home, you can imagine that that cost can, can climb um, very quickly. Oh, yeah. And so finding ways to cap those, uh, those, those premiums, um, potentially capping the inflation that's tapped, tagged onto um, those premiums that people are paying, um, you know, bringing back the look back legislation that uh, Monica Lindine uh, proposed, um, I believe in 2015, which she was trying to set at five years, uh, preventing companies from looking farther back, similar to what we do with auto insurance, which is currently set at three years. Um, but that would eliminate uh, them from trying to use, you know, a small claim of something um, against a, um, someone who's insured who's making a claim for hail. Um, you know, another thought that I've had is um, adding a hail insurance program. Uh, Montana already has one, but it's it's more geared towards farmers and ranchers um, for hail damage when when people have instances of hail damage. Um, you know, one one thought is maybe you know have a hail program um, to help with folks who might have a high deductible, uh, making a fund available to assist with a deductible or some form of, or part of the cost, um, you know, a cap of what the cost might be. And, you know, I've shown that I can work in the legislature and, and work with folks. I think to get some of these things done, um, it does take getting everyone at the table, the industry folks as well to have these discussions. I know um, from conversations with insurance um, agents, uh, especially in that part of the state, a lot of them, buy these same products you know they haven't they pay the premiums for their to insure their homes too right. so it matters to them you know it matters to a lot of them that live in, in our communities um, to see things get improved um, at, at the top level with with insurance coverage um, so those are just some of the things that that I've thought about um, you know lastly the only other idea like that I can think of is find looking at ways to incentivize companies to to continue to provide insurance um, in our communities, maybe some sort of tax incentive, um, and you know, clearly providing educational opportunities on on claims, um, not filing claims when you don't need to. That can help prevent um, folks from um, being being dinged or dropped yeah. when they have a big claim for hail. Great. And then, um, besides insurance, what other things would you like to change about the the auditor office? Yeah, so I think the, the auditor's office is a, a really good opportunity to, to promote business in Montana. I, um, you know, I think one of the, the things that we can do is it's, we can use it as an opportunity to recruit new businesses, um, for instance, or for example, uh, new tech businesses, which is like the largest growing industry in this country. Um, I had a bill last session uh, to add clarity to um, uh, blockchain or utility tokens to make it clear that they are exempt from the Securities Act in Montana. Um, it's clear that they are exempt even when you look at the Securities Act. Um, but there's a lot of things like that where we can bring clarity um, to companies and industries. They're paying attention to this kind of stuff. And when we can shore up those, those types of issues and bring clarity to our law and legislation, it signals to them that we're paying attention to their industries and that we're wanting them uh, to come here, that we're, we're welcoming them and that we're paying attention that um, we're telling them that we're not going to change the rules on you um, after you're, you're already set up 
have set up shop here. Definitely. So I like to end this on kind of more of a personal note. So um, do you have any kind of personal story you'd like to share with us? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'd, I'd like to bring up, um, you know, my, my uh, perspective on why I don't like health sharing scams so much. And, you know, I tell the story a lot. Of, when I was a kid, um, I was outside on actually on crutches and I was, I broke my leg already. Um, and I was going inside, I slipped on some ice and I hit my head on the side of my um, dad's truck. Oh, no. And I got a big gash on my head, I still have it. And the thing I remember about that was when I went inside, um, my mom had my brother take a look at the, the cut on my head. And what they were doing is, um, I didn't realize at the time, but what they were doing was trying to figure out whether or not it was bad enough to go to the doctor. Um, They're trying to figure out whether or not um, it was ri worth risking driving to the hospital, going to the emergency room, um, risking uh, not knowing um, or getting new costs and not knowing whether or not those costs were going to be covered. Um, you know, I, I grew up under Indian Health Services, which is oftentimes life or limb coverage. Um, and, you know, if the, if the, the funding wasn't there for certain things, uh, you know, your coverage was put off um, or, not, or not available. And so, um, so that was, that was my, my reality. Uh, growing up in, in my family and you know I, I know my father and so many other people um, to this day it's it's kind of been baked into a lot of people they're afraid to go to the doctor um, because even though they can oftentimes but it's just like almost second nature where they're worried about going to the doctor um, and not knowing whether that cost of, of that visit is going to be something they're going to be tagged with and they're going to be on the hook for um, so you know that's why like when it comes to um, health sharing scams um, health sharing ministries, I just, it bothers me that people have this false sense of security um, being told that they're going to be covered when one instance could wipe out, you know, one serious uh, incident can wipe out this pot of money and people could be left with nothing, with no coverage at all. Um, I, I just, I think that's scary. Um, it's something that's unacceptable in Montana. Um, and we, and my job is to, to make sure that people are protected um, and that they're being treated fairly with companies. Um, you know, even, uh, you know, for me, I, I just, I, I'll end with this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm clearly running because I, I want the auditor's office. I wanted to give people um, assistance and help um, to help them through situations like this, like the ones I just talked about, like the, the woman with the, um, the walker. Um, mm -hmm. I've lived through these issues. I've seen them firsthand. Um, it's a part of me. It's, it's, it's part of my identity. It's, it's part of the things that I really want to change in, in, in our state. Um, I think when our state and the health of our state's um, doing well, our, everything else does well. You know, our, our, our kids do better in school, our um, economy does better. Um, and, you know, the, the last thing is, is um, I, I also just think people overlook the fact that this, this office really plays such a pivotal role on the, our state um, with our public lands on the state land board. Um, and just want people to know that I'll do everything in my power to, to protect our public lands and protect access. Definitely. So for anybody that is interested in getting a hold of you or getting on your campaign, how can they do that? Yeah, so um, you can visit my website, uh, shaneformontana.com. Um, it's all spelled out, shaneformontana.com. Um, you can also message me on Facebook um, or you can call me. I, I pride myself on being accessible. I think that's uh, something that makes Montana uh, special is that we live in a, a state small enough to where candidates and people are, are um, accessible, um, accessible and, and reachable by phone. And so um, you can call me at 406-546-4290 as well. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Shane, and have a great rest of your night. Hey, thanks, Mitch. You have a good night too.